Hello and welcome to StarCast from Planet Waves. My name's Eric Francis Coppolino, friendly neighborhood astrologer, reporting to you from the astrology studio in Kingston, New York, on a beautiful, cold, sunny, clear, late winter Pisces afternoon. It is good to be with you. I am taking a day off from recording videos today. I have been at this uh, for about two weeks, and I think I've completed about 15 videos in the Eye of the Centaur series. It is coming out magnificent. Uh, I, I feel like Barbara Han Clow channeling the ancient masters as I do these readings, uh, which are focused on the forthcoming April 8th total solar eclipse in Aries conjunct Chiron and several subsequent events, including Jupiter conjunct Uranus and Sedna entering Gemini. Very exciting stuff. Once in a lifetime experience to have two ultra slow movers entering air signs at the same time, that is going to represent a shift in how we think and communicate and relate to one another socially. These readings include uh, about 30 to 40 minutes <clears throat> for each of the sun signs and rising signs, uh, as well as a four part series on Chiron through the signs with a special introduction to Chiron through the signs and an introduction to Chiron and then Chiron return, a transit at age 50 or so for everyone born from 1968 through 1977. This is an exciting project and I am loving it, but I am pausing video action today and tomorrow. I'll probably resume uh, over the weekend, maybe on Sunday. I've got about one day left, and I'll have this to you on time, as promised, on uh, the 4th of March. Uh, incredibly, with so much going on, so many stories uh, occupying the news department of Planet Waves. But let's talk about the current astrology right now, as mentioned. The sun is in Pisces. We've got the sun right now, as of this reading, at about 10 degrees and 40 minutes. Uh, it is in a conjunction with Mercury, so we just and with Saturn. So we just passed the uh, exterior conjunction of the sun and Mercury, which is the halfway point between Mercury retrogrades. When the sun and Mercury form a conjunction, with Mercury direct, you know that you're halfway to the next retrograde, and when they form a conjunction with Mercury retrograde, you know that you're halfway done with the retrograde and uh, kind of uh, over the hill there. But this happened with Saturn in the mix, and it's been a very interesting week. Uh, I was initially reading this as highly productive, and I, I think that... Um, that is uh, that is probably true. It's one reason why I advanced the timing and got going early on somewhere in between, uh, honoring that Saturn Sun Mercury conjunction. Sorry, I have the Centaur that Saturn Sun uh, Mercury conjunction and using time as an ally. So many times, uh, so often in our lives, time is a kind of uh, adversary. And when you shift your relationship to time, to making it into an ally, it seems as if you start showing up places on time and finishing things earlier with a little bit less effort. So as for all that is in Pisces right now, in order of degrees, not of the speed of the planets, it's Saturn, Sun, Mercury, and still in a approximately two-degree conjunction, uh, followed by Nessus at 1723 Pisces. I know I mentioned Nessus a lot, maybe without saying what it is. Nessus is in the family of super intense planetoids of uh, uh, related to Chiron. Uh, Chiron discovered in 77, then there was a pause, and then the second centaur was discovered in 92. That was Pholus, then, uh, then Nessus, 1993, and then... Uh, I believe Cariclo and Asbolas were discovered in 94 and 95. With those five, you've got enough centaurs. You don't need more than 
uh, five, really. I, I, we don't need to overdo it, but I don't, uh, I don't put, well, as bolus is in cancer, let's not go there. <laughs> There's the second set, third centaur in, I could do a whole centaur star cast. That would be fun, actually. If one person asks for it, I'll do it. Uh, Nessus is at 17 and change of, of, of Pisces. And that is a kind of a sleeping element, which is um, a reminder to be conscientious and mindful about potential consequences of your feelings, uh, of your spiritual attitudes and values. And with Mercury in the picture about to form a conjunction to Nessus, about the words that you say and how you say them. Finally, Neptune is <clears throat> lingering around in the uh, very end of uh, at the very end of Pisces. And one of the things that Neptune is doing uh, that is, I think, quite interesting, and I've been factoring it into all of the Eye of the Centaur readings is that Neptune is making a 90-degree angle to the galactic center. And that is, without breaking down all the different parts of that, it boils down, in my mind, and I would love it if you had another interpretation, but it boils down, in my mind, to the question, is this spiritual or is this merely disembodied? Uh, at the time of the development of electricity, that's really in the late 19th century, when it was becoming more commercially viable in the early 20th century, a German philosopher whose name I always forget, <laughs> maybe you'll know who I'm talking about, I think it begins with a K, uh, noted that electricity is disembodying sends you out of your body, including the first use of the electric chair. I cast that chart recently. And that, he said, is inherently spiritual. Oh, really, is it? I would turn that around and uh, ask, ask that as a question and, and maybe uh, propose that uh, spiritual is not leaving your body, at least when you have one, Whatever spiritual is, it's about being here and being present and being focused. So uh, th this, I think, really pushes the question. And we've got this square. It's going to be lingering around all year. It's very close now because the, the galactic core, Sagittarius A star, right at the end of Sagittarius, 27 degrees and change, that's the supermassive black hole at the end of Sagittarius, again, it's called Sagittarius A with a little asterisk, and that's pronounced Sagittarius A star. It's some kind of a physics joke. I can look it up. It was actually pretty funny. Physicists never uh, never hesitate to slip in something funny into their equation or their naming of things. Um, and it is a spiritual beacon, but it's kind of not a very good one because it's so nebulous. At least 10 different times, I was sitting at this desk or another desk in some country writing a horoscope column or pondering the mysteries and thought, ah, now I get what the galactic core is about. I understand this point. I have delineated it. Congratulations, Eric. And then I forget it five minutes later. <laughs> I'm like, I should have written that down. <laughs> so that happened so many times, so many times that I realized this is about nebulous spiritual signals that are difficult to remember and are challenging to put into words. And you, it may seem like the insight is so immediate, relevant, and meaningful that you don't need to write it down like that dream that you forgot. Why write it down? You'll remember this forever. Then it's like, uh, what was I looking for wandering around that forest? So... Uh, I built this into a delineation of the galactic center, which it is a beacon, but the beacon has a way of uh, disappearing into the mists. Neptune works in a similar fashion. Only the problem with Neptune is that it, it, it can take spiritual impulses and reduce them down to, let's get drunk. And that's not going to work for very long. Though some plenty of uh, excellent things have been written 
uh, while drunk. Heck, once in my entire life, I, I wrote a poem when I was drunk. I haven't gotten drunk that many times in my life, but one time I did, and I wrote a poem, and it's one of my favorite poems. So I could see where writers would uh, use a little bit of this psychic lubrication of alcohol to just kind of loosen up and let it flow so you're not having to make a decision uh, right before you put every word uh, in, into uh, in, into the computer or onto the page, right? That's, that'd be freaking maddening. Uh, so when you've got the nebulous signal of the galactic center and the nebulous signal of Neptune, it's almost like having two beautiful colors th that work independently of one another mixed together and becoming kind of... Uh, muddy and nondescript. Is that brown or does that look like it wants to be purple kind of thing? And so this is, this is challenging uh, in a world and in a time where there are so many substitutes for connecting with your inner essence, your, your inner teacher, more accurately. Um, and, and the inner teacher is the single most important thing that you can learn how to make contact with, listen to, and experiment with enough to trust in anything that we might vaguely <clears throat> call the spiritual path. It has very little to do with formal meditation practice. It has very little to do with formal spiritual scholarship or religious scholarship or theology or anything like that, your inner teacher is a facet of your own consciousness. It is an element of your own mind and being that you can choose to listen to <clears throat> instead of the voice that is constantly uh, provoking anxiety and uh, solipsistic, don't you hate that word? self-centeredness and uh, accusation and fear and all the different forms of the same thing that are essentially what A Course in Miracles calls the ego. You, there are, as Led Zeppelin said, two paths you can go by. And one of those paths is the path of fear. And the other one is the calmer, small, still voice within and that is the voice of your inner teacher. And so in, in this time when there are so many substitutes for that, and when people really think that they're an expert on something because they are suspicious about something, because they have some notion of what might be going on, some deep conspiracy, and, and not only do they uh, not verify it, but they very often assume they are absolutely correct, there are magical substitutes for the inner teacher pretty much everywhere you look, but there is no substitute for that element of your consciousness that knows what is true and necessary for you. But this is based on a relationship that you form. All right, speaking of relationships, Venus and Mars are close together in Aquarius. They don't make conjunctions very often. They just made one over the course of the past week. Uh, there's a very funny chart that came up. I made I made the first purchase of the book by Mark and Sam Bailey. They sent they sent the test they sent the 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 uh, the, the store link to me cuz they knew that I would immediately take out my credit card and spend $9 on them and tell them how the, how the sales experience went. And so when I did that, I cast the chart. And so I have a chart for the first sale of the new book, The Final Pandemic, and it has got this very funny thing in it. The sixth house, which is the house of medicine, healing, and doctors, has the Venus-Mars conjunction in Aquarius right in the sixth house. So we've got Mark and Sam in Aquarius, right where they belong, speaking to the people, in the sixth house. It's one of those beautiful moments where uh, astrology could not be more apropos if you attempted to design it yourself. But that's the beauty of astrology, is it's better than you can think it up. All right, so uh, meanwhile, speaking of Venus and Mars in Aquarius, as of this recording today at about 2 o'clock, 
Uh, the moon is approaching Venus and Mars in a square, and it's also approaching Jupiter in an opposition. So that is uh, a, a enlargement, exa an exaggeration of all of those points. So we've got that Scorpio moon, square Mars, going to be square Venus, and it's going to be opposite Jupiter, and then it's going to also be opposite Uranus. That's a big-ass T-square with the moon in Scorpio. Could be moody, could be frisky, could be kinky. Then, while this is going on, fortunately, the moon makes a series of trines to all of those elements in Pisces, uh, which presents a sense of ease and flow as opposed to the jarring, tense relationships of the Scorpio moon fixed, square fixed Mars, square fixed Venus, square fixed Jupiter. That's got this sensation that something's got to give. Uh, when, when someone is not persuaded, just try persuading them more, which probably won't work. But the moon makes those trines to all of those things. It makes a trine to Saturn, and then the Sun, and then Mercury, and then Nessus, and then Neptune. So it's suggesting that there is uh, basically an easy way to do things and a difficult way to do things. Meanwhile, the, set, the uh, Scorpio moon becomes the Sagittarius moon uh, on Saturday, the 2nd. And so basically through... Uh, most of the weekend, the moon will be in Sagittarius. Uh, that is one of the more upbeat and optimistic signs. It will be then speaking to Mars and uh, the, and Venus in a kind of a harmonious uh, relationship, a sextile relationship. If all, this all sounds very complicated, actually, it's not really necessary. And I talk about it because you're interested and it's also a fun way to contemplate the passage of time. Uh, and I write my horoscopes in a, a way that is circumspect enough to give you an opportunity to tune into these qualities of the passage of time that you might not have recognized, uh, but also not written in such a way that is needlessly discouraging because even when there are very challenging aspects, there can be highly productive uh, things that, that will happen. And one, uh, one of those things is the moon being void, of course. And I'm always talking about how sometimes really wild things happen when the moon is void, of course, meaning in the very last degree of a sign or approaching the last degree of a sign, and one of the charts I keep above my desk is the chart for Steve Jobs walking out on stage at 9.14 a.m. on January 9, 2007 at, in San Francisco and introducing the iPhone and the moon is in the very last degree of Virgo. Most astrologers would have said, no, 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 don't do that. So there, there are exceptions and sometimes big exceptions to every rule. And I think that astrology is just uh, simply interesting and depending on how you use it, potentially useful. And more than anything, astrology offers a shift in perspective from being on the field at the level of the game to being above the field, looking down at the game. And there is something inherently uh, creating of a more objective or circumspect point of view when astrology is engaged. This gives you a way to consider your life without being completely wrapped up in it. And part of the beauty of the horoscope is it's just a story. And you can say, well, maybe that applies to me. Maybe that doesn't apply to me. Hey, what was that thing? What, what, what was that about uh, walking through a vineyard and picking grapes isn't that strange i i just did that the day after that i know the day before i read the horoscope all right so um this this piece you're listening to here is my favorite of the um approximately 60 little ambient exercises created by jelko mcmullen a few years ago thank you for listening please check out eye of the centaur lots of love Signing off from Kingston, New York. Bye for now. <laughs>